Hi, it's Bruce Williams again, and I'm going to give you a brief lecture today on the gross pathology of the hematolymphatic system in swine. And as I do at the beginning of every lecture, I like to thank the colleagues that have given me images that I've used in this lecture and other lectures over the years. Here's a great lesion, but it's a rare disease in pigs. And you can see the brown discoloration of the bones here. And if we had the pig in front of us, we would see that the teeth are discolored. Histologically, there's no change in the structure of the bone, simply this pigmentation. And this is a disease known as congenital erythrocytic porphyria. Traditionally, a defect in uroporphyrinogen 3 cosynthetase, although the gene that causes the disease in pigs has never been definitively isolated. Erythrocytic porphyria is a little different in pigs than other species that get it more commonly, like cattle and people, because affected swines are not anemic and they don't present with signs of photosensitization. So its relationship to congenital erythrocytic porphyria and other species is unclear. We're looking at tonsillar tissue in the back of the throat of a pig. And pigs have a lot of tonsillar tissue in their throat, including this tissue on either side of the epiglottis, as well as a large palatine tonsil. And here we're looking at hemorrhages within this tonsillar tissue, which will ultimately progress to become necrotic foci. The most reliable postmortem features of acute hog cholera or classical swine fever is tonsillar necrosis, peripheral hemorrhages in the lymph node, and petechial hemorrhages throughout the body. Remember that the pestivirus that causes hog cholera is endotheliotropic and will cause damage both in the acute phase due to its attack on endothelial cells and chronic phase when affected animals develop large amounts of antigen antibody complexes which precipitate into vessels and cause vasculitis later on. Here's a large palatine tonsil with areas of hemorrhage and necrosis in classical swine fever. There are a number of other viruses and bacteria that will cause similar lesions so this is a good finding if you have other lesions supportive of hog cholera, but not something to base your diagnosis on totally. Here's a lymph node from an affected pig, and we can see the hemorrhages at the periphery of the node. I don't know quite how specific these are, because as pig nodes are essentially inside-out lymph nodes. Pigs have interesting lymph nodes. That would probably the be the medullary sinuses. So lymph nodes of pigs with hot cholera will be hemorrhagic. I just don't know how significant this hemorrhage at the periphery actually is. A lesion that is actually uncommonly seen in classical swine fever, but a great almost diagnostic lesion is the presence of infarcts at the periphery of the spleen. The spleen will be enlarged as it's enlarged with a number of other conditions that we'll look at, but marginal infarcts are very characteristic of hog cholera. I will say I do not have a tremendous amount of expertise with this and a very, very similar disease, African swine fever, but I've learned over the years that uh, some of the lesions are interchangeable. So when I see the lesions that are classically associated with hog cholera, such as splenic infarcts and the hemorrhagic lymph nodes, I always offer swine fever as a differential. Here are lymph nodes that are from a pig that was infected eight days previously with African swine fever. They are very hemorrhagic and can look very much like those in hog cholera. And this is one of my favorite pictures taken from South Africa in the late 50s. And there's an actual ring of hemorrhagic mesenteric lymph nodes. Now when you incise these lymph nodes, lo and behold, you see the same peripheral hemorrhage that we just said was classic 
for hog cholera or classical swine fever. So I take the path of least resistance and when I see lesions I, that are characteristic of either disease, I once again always offer that differential of the other. We talked previously about other viruses and diseases that will cause tonsil and necrosis and how it is not specific for hog cholera. Here we have large areas of necrosis in the tonsillar tissue of a pig affected with pseudorabies. Pseudorabies is one of those diseases that attacks the tonsils first and from there the severity of the disease is based on the path it takes and most importantly on the age of the pig. In young pigs this virus can ascend through the olfactory nerves and the, into the trigeminal ganglia and make its way into the brain by transaxonal transport resulting in meningitis, encephalitis, and death. In older animals the disease tends to be less severe the older the pig is. In animals from weaning to growing, growing finishing and in adult animals it often gets into the lungs and causes a mild necrotizing pneumonia and you may not see any lesions in adult animals until sows begin aborting. There are also a number of bacterial agents who come in through the tonsils of the pig and these are multifocal abscesses in the tonsil of a pig um, and diseases that I like to think about in pigs that affect the tonsils would include first of all salmonella a number of types of salmonella which are host specific including salmonella cholera suis and salmonella typhi suis which you'll probably never isolate in animals other than pigs may cause abscesses in the tonsils as a primary sign anthrax is another disease that comes in through the oral cavity in pigs and results in abscesses in the tonsils. And then there are some more common bacteria like Strepsuis, which may also result in tonsillar abscesses and various species of leptospirosis. Here's a great picture by David Dreymeyer showing massively enlarged inguinal lymph nodes. And if we cut these in, we would see that there is profound expansion of macrophages resembling granulomatous inflammation. And this is seen with infection by porcine circovirus 2, a virus that really likes to grow in macrophages. So in affected tissues, it's going to make sure that it has a lot of cells there that it likes to replicate in. If you look carefully in lymph nodes, you will probably find within a significant portion of the macrophages, the characteristic botryoid inclusions associated with this viral condition. And in some cases, you may want to look over the hindquarters for the hemorrhages that characterize the condition of porcine dermatitis and nephritis syndrome. Here's a great picture of the mesenteric lymph nodes of a pig that is infected with porcine circovirus type 2. And you can see granulomous inflammation has caused massive enlargement. Just a couple of, of other anatomic things. You will often see wrinkling of the muscularis of the terminal ilium. It almost looks a little bit like a cow with Yoni's disease. And this is a normal finding. It's, an inc it's not even an incidental finding. This is normal for pigs, so don't get concerned about uh, a case of lawsoniasis or whatever. You need to make sure that you incise that gut, but you may find that it's totally normal. This little bulgy thing right here is the ileocecal valve. It looks a little odd in pigs, but totally normal. And finally, some isolated lymph nodes from porcine circovirus type 2. These are a little hemorrhagic, but, uh, but 
the very large, diffuse expansion of these lymph nodes makes you want to think at least today about porcine circovirus type 2. Now I'm going to give you an identical lesion which is old school and this picture was taken about 40 or 50 years ago. And we're also looking at the gut of a pig and the very enlarged mesenteric lymph nodes. If you cut these in you would also see granulomatous inflammation but this picture was taken well before the knowledge of porcine circovirus and the incised lymph nodes uh, in this great picture by uh, Jose Ramos Vera show granulomatous inflammation as well and rarely calcification. And this is Mycobacterium avium infection in swine. In swine, mycobacteria appear to infect the tonsils and the intestinal mucosa initially and then spread to the original lymph nodes, especially of the cervical area and the mesenteric lymph nodes. Lesions grow very slowly and in most cases the animal will be very successful in walling these off. Affected animals with localized tuberculosis lesions and I use that term very loosely here but the disease is often called swine tuberculosis. Uh, in swine with, with localized infections there are usually no clinical signs. Only a very small number of them will this disease become more generalized and the animals will waste away despite adequate feeding. Oh what a great picture by Dr. Raquel Rett from the Texas A&M University. And here we have that wrinkly ileum again. Don't get concerned about this. Somewhat enlarged mesenteric nodes which are orange. And this is a normal finding in a pig who has been given an iron dextran injection or probably more likely is being supplemented by iron. Remember the piglets are born with very little iron reserves and the colostrum and the milk from the cell also provides relatively little iron, perhaps iron, probably only about uh, 25 to 50 percent of the daily requirement. So if they're raised in confinement away from soil, iron deficiency anemia is pretty much a foregone conclusion unless they're supplemented. So most of the pigs get an injection in the first day of life. One last thing is to talk about a blood parasite that used to be much more common is occasionally seen today in pigs and has a new name is what used to be Epirythrozoan suis and is now called Mycoplasma suis. This is a sporadic disease usually seen in young pigs and it is a parasite of the erythrocytes and so we will see an extravascular anemia, a very large spleen but no detectable icterus and the infected erythrocytes are taken out of the circulation in the spleen. The normal macrophage, monocyte or reticuloendothelial population of the spleen will get very large so the spleen gets very large. If you're very uh, uh, observant, you will also see milk spots on the liver of this particular pig, which are due to migration by ascarids, including Ascarisuum and Stephanurus. And like so many pigs, there is probably an occult pneumonia going on. Well, thank you for your attention. I was able to get this one in under 15 minutes, so I'm going to stop talking now, and I hope you've enjoyed this little video.